expert, Michaela Camino from Argentina. Michaela is a biologist and conservationist working in the South American Chaco region. She's the rec director at an organization working with local and indigenous communities on the conservation of Chaco's biodiversity. She's also a researcher at the National Council of Scientific and Technical Research in Argentina. Michaela is an Edge of Existence Fellow and a Whitley Award winner from 2022. Let's bring her in. Hi, good morning. How's everybody doing? Good morning, Hi, Michaela. And good afternoon. Good, good, morning. good evening to everybody. Yeah, good oh, evening. Wow. Yeah. Wow. We are yeah. We're about a third of our way through the Global Biodiversity Festival. So um, we're excited to hear from you. You're calling in from Argentina. Yes, I'm in Chaco, in the Chaco region, in the north of Argentina, in the forest. There's a huge storm here. I hope you can hear me well. We can hear you well. Let's hope it, it doesn't cut our power out. Um, yeah, I hope so. <laughs> well, yeah. that's really exciting. Um, I'm excited to learn more about this region. I don't know anything about it. so. Um, I'll let you take it away here. Perfect. So I will share my screen. Great. Uh, yeah, let's pull it up. We can almost hear the, the storm outside your window. <laughs> yeah. kind of fun and exciting. Okay, so now can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Perfect. Well, as Brianna was saying, my name is Micaela Camino. I am in Argentina and I am the founder and director of Proyecto Quimilero and I was also work as a researcher of the National Research Council. And today I want to tell you about our work uh, trying to save this amazing species, the Chacuan Pecri, and working in the dry Chaco region together with indigenous and local communities. And so I thought that the best way of starting this presentation is by the beginning. And the thing is how I got to work here, because I, I grew up in a huge city in Buenos Aires. It's the capital city in Argentina. But I always loved traveling and I didn't have much money. So I traveled across my own continent. Can you, I guess you can see how um, the, the images change. Let me know if there's something wrong. So yeah, I was traveling around and getting to see really um, amazing landscapes and species and all this beauty. And I was really amazed by the fact that there's always people uh, in these amazing places and interacting with these great species. These local cultures are really rich and I, I got really interested into that and I decided to work in conservation. I was already studying biology and when I finished my first degree, I was I continued traveling and I reached the Chaco region and I was fascinated by Chaco. Um, first, because it's huge, like you can see here, it's um, the South American continent and you can see in red the great South American Chaco and in green, the dry Chaco region. So it is a huge region and, and you can really feel that when you're there, like it's the largest tropical subtropical dry forest of the world. You also have grasslands and bushlands and you can feel that in your body. You can travel so many days without seeing a huge city or paved roads. And I love that. And there are amazing species here, many of which are usually associated to areas with with a lot of water and wetness, but here in the dry Chaco, it's amazing how they adapt to live many months without water in the, in the surface. And there are also many endemic species you can see in the center, the Chaco and Pecri, which is endemic to the forests of the dry Chaco, but it actually, um, there are many endemic species. It's not the only one. And there are also many people living in these uh, natural ecosystems, indigenous and non-indigenous communities that have a very deep connection with nature and their livelihoods are closely linked to wildlife. So that's that's what I love. That's what, I, what I'm interested in. So I, I was really amazed by, by all this huge things that I had in my own country and I did not know about the Chaco region. So I decided to do some research about the region and I found out that we had not much information actually about the dry Chaco. 
So I decided to stay and travel a little bit to get to know the area. And we also started doing some interviews with local people to get to know which species were actually present in, in the region outside protected areas and the habitat these species used and how the relation between humans and wildlife was in this area. And also to address the conservation problems and the conservation solutions that local people could see to these problems. And it was great because um, I actually found that the region was rich in species and then the missions as I as it was supposed to and uh, the species were still there and people were like eating these species every day and using these species as medicine and these species also had a really important cultural and identitarian and often spiritual relevance for local people so the relation was there and so I was more interested in staying and we started to develop a locally based monitoring system together with some of these local communities. And this was a great experience because we started to, to work together. We designed our objectives together and how we were going to gather the information in the field, the, the survey techniques, and we exchanged information about we, we gave information about how to use a camera or a GPS or a computer, satellite images. And then they gave us information about the species and about how they would connect, uh, collect information, what species eat, hunting sites. So we, it was a really rich experience, I think, for both sides, local communities and us. And we got a lot of information that was useful to understand the habitat of wildlife species outside protected areas. And among many other things, I guess the most important things that we learned back then was um, that there's a big issue with land tenure in the region where local communities may or may not have a, a property with secure land tenure, but they actually use and need a much larger area to survive physically and culturally. So it was really, uh, we saw that like this could be a problem and started to work with them and talk with them about that and about their conception of territory, which is much deeper and complex than the one that I had before starting working with indigenous and non-indigenous local communities of the Chaco region. And we also found uh, another thing that we found is that there was still present the Chaco and Pecari, this unique endemic species that only exists in this region and it's highly endangered uh, was a surprise to find outside protected areas because um, basically people responsible for, for natural goods in the Chaco province, where we were focusing our efforts, told us that they thought it was extinct outside protected areas. And it actually was there and people were eating the species without knowing it was so unique. And the, I, I, we were really happy to find it. And here's where we were and working in this amazing landscape when we started to see um, a really huge deforestation advance over the forest, which is something really hard to see because the forest just disappears completely and all the wildlife you're working with disappears completely. We started to check what was going on, why this was happening and if it was legal or not, the way that the deforestation was advancing and it actually is not legal according to Argentinas and internationals laws and we saw how um, deforestation is actually driven by uh, foreign companies grabbing lands and and concentrating power for exporting natural goods and this forces local communities to leave their homes so local people we were working with they they were forced to leave their houses or to cut their own trees so it was something really hard to live and we did not know how to manage that and what to do about that because it was something new and something really hard to live um, and to see. But we decided to stay and that's when we formalized our existence as Proyecto Quimilero. We decided to work for the conservation of the Chacoan Pecari and its habitat and meanwhile working to promote the sustainable development and respectful development for local communities. And we thought that the Chacoan Pecari was the perfect species to focus in because it's an endangered species. So itself, it's a really valuable one. Endemic only exists in this region, but also because 
this species needs the forests to survive. So if we succeed in saving the forests, uh, that will be the only path in which we can succeed in saving the species. We need the forests to save the Chacon Pecri. And the forests have a lot of species and the forests have a lot of people and cultures. So we can work on the whole social ecosystem, social ecosystem that we have here and the whole cultural landscape. And we can also use this species as a flagship locally because people kind of likes it. It's not like a puma or jaguar that people may be afraid of because of conflicting situations. So we decided to work on three main areas. That's how we're working now. We have research. Uh, we try to influence public policy and design and, and help implement correctly the existing normative. And we work to strengthen local communities. And all our work is we try to do it horizontally with, with local communities together. So regarding research, I will just give a brief information about what we're doing, but um, we found that for the Chacuan Pecri, we have less than 20 years of habitat for the species if the forestation continues to advance with the same patterns and speed as now. But the good news is that the species actually can occupy and use the forests that are home to the local communities, indigenous and non-indigenous people. So that is great because it gives us the opportunity to work with local people for the conservation of the species, but protected areas are not enough. So you can see in red how they are too small and isolated. And the only ones that are big enough to sustain viable populations in the long term are in the north. This is Paraguay and this is Bolivia, but this would be the case if there, if this uh, protected areas had no hunting and no deforestation, and that's not actually the case in the implementation in reality. So this could have viable populations in the long term, but uh, in the way they are managed now, they, they will not be able to do that. So afterwards, we decided to check which of these forests are um, belong to indigenous and local communities. And uh, we so far did the indigenous part, we saw that uh, at least 44% of the remaining forests of the region are indigenous people's lands. And that when local indigenous people have security in their land tenure, they, they have a secure land tenure, their lands work as deforestation barriers. But when they don't, then their lands can or may or may not work as deforestation barriers. And actually, 67% of indigenous people's lands have insecure land tenure. So that's a huge problem regarding rights and regarding conservation. We're also still trying to work on what territories, hunting, land tenure, and trying to better understand uh, how this relate and how this relates to uh, subsistence hunting and nutrition security for local communities, among other studies we're doing. We also try to meet with uh, decision makers, participate in legal measures that have been done. Uh, we've been trying to influence uh, the laws that regulate how the forests are used in Argentina and particularly in the Chaco province where we have our main efforts and working again, not only with decision makers and other government um, institutions, but also with the civil society, with the general public and uh, trying to tell people how amazing our region is and how close we are to to these forests and how dependent our lives are on these forests because if we lose them we lose climate regulation we lose the fertility of our so soils we lose everything so we are also telling or we told actually the the society what what is going on with local communities and how we're losing these forests for no reason but power concentration. So people organize themselves and they, they are uh, asking for to conserve the forest. And we also work with local communities. We're trying to build and increase local capacities by telling local communities their rights and providing research and monitoring tools for them to make informed based decisions on their natural goods and on their lands. We're also trying to build a support network 
putting together in contact local communities with professionals and other groups for them to be able to have a support network and have visibility. We have some YouTube videos in our channel. It's called Proyecto Quimilero. And we also try to raise the value of local knowledge and of biodiversity, both inside the forest and outside the forest. We even got people from the forest to teach in national universities, um, a special class for conservationists and for people in social sciences. So trying to bring local knowledge and give the value it deserves and working with children and teachers to deepen the roots that you, you have to these lands and that you may lose under all this deforestation advance and working on the well-being, uh, the basic well-being of, of local communities. So we got some recognition about this, about the, the recognition was from the parliament and we got the Whitley Funds for Nature Award. We also got the a legal measure that stopped deforestation and strategic plans to, to manage the species. We can see how the society is involved now asking to stop deforestation. And we are increasing awareness also on our endemic and unique Chacoan Pecri. Of course, there's a lot, much more to do. And we actually think that we really need to work with local communities. We need to relate with them. We need to respect the, the diversity of cultures and knowledge we have in Argentina and acknowledge that we are a diverse country and there are different livelihoods and cultures. And we need to work with them together horizontally with responsibility and transparency to build real solutions to the climate and environmental crisis we're facing because with these local solutions where we join local knowledge and local cultures with science knowledge, I'm sure we can build a real solution that from local can escalate to regional and global solutions. So that's our idea of conservation. We think this can really work. We can see our results here in Chaco and I hope you liked the Chaco region. You can always check our web page or write us an email. And thank you very much for your attention. Wow, thank you so much. Um, that was really, really interesting. And wow, what an experience to think that a species in an, is in danger, is, is extinct from an area and then to find it again or to know that it's yeah. there. What was that like for you? It was insane. I mean, I loved Chaco from the beginning because it was insane the whole time. Like you have this huge region and, and you are like, okay, I'll, I'll go and do my research because I didn't know anything about Chaco. And I'm talking about 2010. And, and there was so little information about such a huge region. And I couldn't believe that we still had a, a, huge, a huge area to explore, a forested area to explore. I was so happy. Like, I love mystery and I love research and I love adventure. So it was like a paradise for me. And then already working there, it's every time you find something new. And now we have other research groups working in the area. And so they find different things too. And you're amazed by that. Like, we're still finding things in 2023. Uh, so I think wow. it's, uh, yeah, it's, I love working here. It's amazing. Yeah. It, it, so often we hear this sort of doom and gloom, like we're, you know, everything is needing attention and humans have taken over. And so to know that you can go out there into the forest, be, you know, like you said, um, travel for days without cities and roads and really get to discover new species and new biodiversity and new ways that it, it's all interacting together is just an inspiring and hopeful message for the future of our planet. So I loved hearing your presentation and learning about that work. Um, what was it like for you? You mentioned traveling um, really got you inspired to do this kind of work. And like you said, when you first entered this region, you'd travel for days without seeing cities or roads. And so how did that um, allow you to connect to nature? What was that experience like for you? I mean, I, I always loved traveling and, and I always loved nature. And, and while traveling, I always feel so happy and, and thankful to nature. And, 
and to people living in nature, right? And I learned so much. So in Chaco was kind of following up that experience I had in other places like Andes or Amazonia and getting to know people and people so kind, they, they will bring you a chair and share, we, we have mate here in Argentina, it's like a, a tea. So they will share a mate with you and we will have a very nice conversation. And I've always been so well received and learned so much. And yeah, I don't know, it's like, I think when you are in nature, you can feel how thankful you are and how you want to give back uh, to that area and how you are also, that there is, nature is part of you. You are part of that system. So it's kind of helping yourself, right? So if we are in a crisis, yourself, each of us is in a crisis and each of us is needed to solve that crisis. Yeah, definitely. We are, we are part of nature and we impact nature and um, it's, it's nice to feel connected like that. Um, one thing you bring up a lot is working with local communities. And I think that is sort of a theme we're seeing with a lot of people's work um, at the Global BioFest. And that wasn't always the case. It wasn't always um, a thing where, where researchers and policy um, makers were working with local communities. So what's your, what's your thought if, if that wasn't part of your work? How would that impact what you're doing? And really... Tell us, tell us a bit more about the importance for um, that method of doing your work. Well, in, in my case, I always thought it was like something basic to do, to work with local communities. Like it's the base of what we do. And I think it's actually needed. And if we think about it, if you go to somebody's house, you will always ask for permission. You will always work with that person if that person wants to work with you and allows you to get in. So why would you not do that when there's a community living there? And perhaps they are not just exactly in that part of the forest, but that, that will not mean that is not part of their home, right? It may be part of their history or part of their hunting sites. So why would you, why would you ignore what they've learned for centuries and think that because you have a title, like, yeah, I have a PhD, for example. So I have a PhD that took me, I don't know, five years. Uh, so I know more than someone that was raised there and uh, lived there, uh, their families lived there for centuries or for many years. And I'm not saying that what I know is not, it's not valuable. Uh, but what I'm saying is like, yeah, I know lots of things, but they do know lots of things too. So why wouldn't we join what we know and be patient to, to join that information and, and find new ways. We need to find new ways. Excluding people will never be a good option because if you exclude people for creating a protected area, like put yourself in that situation. Someone comes and says, yeah, you cannot go to this part of your house, the pharmacy and the supermarket here because now this is protected and you ruin it and you've been there forever. And actually like the remaining forests are in indigenous lands. They're, they're, they have been conserving those lands. And I'm sure that non-indigenous people are also conserving forest cover too. So if hunting is not sustainable, I think what we should do, for example, is finding a solution. We studied, okay, now let's find a solution for these people to have their culture, have food, have nutrition, and we have biodiversity altogether. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And it seems like the threats to um, the forest is really scary in my mind. Illegal logging and land grabbing. Um, these are really serious issues and they seem a bit dangerous to your work as well. Do you ever encounter that fear around, um, you know, the, the politics that exists with um with this kind of work and how it can really impact people's day-to-day -day lives who live there um, when yes. things happen like displacement. Yes, I mean, there are provinces where displacements are more violent. I work in a province where there, there is violence, of course, but um, and we try to be really careful. But yes, we do have serious problems. For example, there's a, an indigenous community where we have two people that disappeared and uh, we don't know why, we don't know where they are, young uh, guys that disappear too in, in a few years. So yes, there are horrible situations that we see. We see old people crying because they signed something they did not know what it was and it was that 
they are accepted to cut their trees or, or things like it's really hard and at the beginning when we started to see that we we really doubted if we were going to be able to stay but that is when we decided to create Proyecto Quimilero and to stay and have a different perspective like uh, including this this policy side and and understanding that if you go to the middle of the forest to the best preserved portion of the of the forest and the forestation comes to you where are you going to go because this is a problem that we have across the world so if we leave then we may find this again somewhere and we have this compromise also with people we're working with so of course we don't want to um, put ourselves in risks that that would not be uh, smart that would not be useful but as far as we are safe we want to help and and build something together yeah well we're definitely celebrating the fantastic work that you're doing um so thank you, thank you for for taking on such an incredible job um i'm going to take a, a question from the chat here so what role does empathy play in your work and how do you make the general public care not only about animals, but also about people living with biodiversity? Well, empathy, I think it's very important. I actually was a few weeks ago in a conservation, biodiversity conservation conference, and there was this guy who works with um, large companies and tries to convince these huge uh, companies to have some conservation uh, landscape design and stuff and you need empathy to work with people always so i i he said yeah i need empathy to work with with these uh people from the large companies and i i don't perhaps that's not my role because i won't feel that empathy i feel much more connected to local communities and indigenous people and i can feel that empathy there and so you can put yourself in the in the shoes of of the other, right? Mm -hmm. uh, also, my father was criollo, so I, I kind of have some root there. Um, and then regarding the public, I think people is every day more aware about the crisis that we're living in, and about when you talk about the the human rights violation, it's not something that you can say like. It's not something light, right? So I think anyone that hears that in their own country or in their own pro province is having such a huge problem will put attention to you. I'm not like an expert in marketing or publicity. Like I don't know about those things. I just told people what I saw and then just it started rolling and joined the, this, this information that's coming from other sites about the, 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 the global crisis that we're facing. Yeah, well, I can see how empathy really um, in, plays a role in the work that you're doing um, from yeah. your presentation and, and just all the different people that you're working with. Um, and so for my final question is, what advice would you give um, youth or people looking to get into this kind of work? It seems like you have uh, the science background, you need to work with people on a pol policy level, um, you work with local um, indigenous groups, looks like you do some education work and outreach. So lots of different skills. So what advice would you give for someone looking to get into this kind of field? Well, I would say it's definitely for younger people. <laughs> it's, it's uh, you, if you feel it, like if you feel it in your heart, just go and do it. Don't hear when they say it's impossible. Just take what other people uh, can tell you and it's useful for you, but don't don't be scared. And, you know, when I was starting, most people said it was impossible. Like, no, you cannot do that. No, you won't succeed. No, people will not be interested. No, you will not get a PhD in Chaco because it's impossible. And it's not because I'm special. It's because I think you we need to feel in our heart what we want and use our brain to, to put that feeling into a cool idea and hear grown-ups and other people with more experience with a limit because we may have our own experience and something that did not work before may work now. So it's good to take a, a, a path that exists, but uh, it's, it's also very important for each of you to build a new path because each 
thing that you will do will matter a lot even if we make mistakes because we make mistakes all the time we only tell the like the really nice story but every day we make a mistake and sometimes it's a big mistake and then we'll spend a lot of time trying to fix it and we will learn and that's how we learn and that's we need the way we need to study and check the papers and check what other people say to there are things we can mistakes we can save and there are others that just go and do it well, incredible work that you're doing. And thank you so much for sharing a little bit about this region of the world. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thanks for inviting me here. I'm really happy to be able to share what we're doing here. Yeah. All right. Take care.